In a world that can be challenging, and at times unpredictable, it's hard to find moments to focus on what you need. Join Stephanie James on The Spark as she guides you to use your inner flame to ignite your best life. As a best-selling author, psychotherapist, transformational life coach, and international show host, Stephanie is dedicated to helping you create a life that takes you, your goals, and your passions to the next level, so you can live a life that is fully lit up and fully alive. She believes that your life is meant to be a beautiful expression of the things that light you up, that by living your dreams, you give permission to others to do the same. Are you ready to feel alive and inspired to fuel your dreams and put a fire behind your desires? Let's ignite a spark in one another that will illuminate the world. The Spark with your host, Stephanie James, starts now. Welcome to The Spark. I'm your host, Stephanie James. So happy to have you here with us on this show, just sending out a big hug to everyone. We all could use a little extra love. So today, if you don't have someone right now that's close by for a hug, we can wrap our arms around ourselves and give ourselves a warm embrace. I have with us today such a special guest, Mahaline Lewis, who goes by Maha. And she has an amazing new book out called The Code of Opposites, a sacred guide to playing with power and not getting burned. It just came out February 22nd. Such a delight to have her here with us. She's an artist, spiritual advisor, co-founder of Empowering Now. And I love this, a child at heart. And she says that it's with little H, little E, big A-R-T. She is definitely a beautiful artist. So thank you so much, Maha, for being here with me. Oh, thank you for having me. It is truly, truly a pleasure. Well, thank you so much. You know, the first time that we met, there was just this instantaneous, immediate spark, immediate... Yes connection. And one of the beautiful things you shared with me was a little bit about your journey, Mm -hmm. about where you came from. um, And we'll, I want to get to the book, but in this segment, I'd love to give the audience a little bit of a chance to know you and to know a little bit about your journey, where you come from. Well, that's a lovely question. Sometimes I wonder where I come from. You know, it's uh, it's like, I think that many of us can relate to the the story of the ugly duckling that somehow could not fit in his family of origin. And you may hear my voice being trembly. And it is part of that journey It is part of the journey of emergence, of looking for the voice, and of knowing what the voice was here to express. So physically, I started in France. I was born in Paris of all places. My family was from North Africa. My parents and my, uh, my both my parents had just moved to Paris, France, out of the same ugly duckling feelings where they did not belong there. They had to expand and, uh, and play with the city of light where something magical would happen for them. Of course, the story continues and reinvents itself when I also had to change continent. So from Paris, France, actually at that time it was no longer Paris, but Leo, but from France to America was a giant move, not only because of the distance, 
But when I came to America, I didn't speak a word of English. I just knew that I needed something bigger. I also had left France thanks to a French baker who was my friend in Lyon. And he also has the same ugly duckling story. So he found a job in America as a baker and asked me to marry him at a time where my life was a complete disaster in France. So even though there was no passion and he only was a friend, I said yes. And I married a Catholic baker on a Shabbat, which is about the worst rebellion, the worst insult I can do to a very traditional Jewish family. So when I arrived in the States, for me, it was the land of the free. I was done with all of my disease, more exactly the disease of my parents. And um, of course, it didn't take long to realize that what I had left on another continent lived in my blood in my bones and in my DNA. And that if I really wanted to be free, then a lot of healing needed to happen. Meanwhile, I couldn't teach literature, could not be a journalist as I used to be in France. So not knowing what to do, I started painting because there was one thing that I could not compromise, and that was expression. I had to find a way to communicate. And art provided that. The second cultural shock, besides coming to the States, was discovering this uncanny art that came through me. So that was beyond words. It was surreal. And uh, I'm going to stop here because I realize I've already said a lot. So, Well, it's a beautiful story. I mean, I, I love that art is that universal language. that can break yes. down all barriers. And so that's what you went to as a means of expressing yourself instead of feeling stifled or that you had to hold that in. Yes, I, I could not use words. So I went to colors and I believe that having left everything behind, my family, my friends, my roots, my language produced such a shock that there was no block in the energy to express itself. Like from one day to the next, I tapped into a talent that I never knew was there. And in that space where I was painting, it was like another world. In that world, I could not make any errors. It's like if I, I chose silk as a medium, and uh, in New York City, no one painted on silk. So very quickly, my work was sold and in gallery. But more importantly, I was looking at what was coming through me with awe and wonder because I knew it was not me doing it. I knew I was a, just a channel. And that knowing is how 
I never had any judgment of my art. And something even more surprising, and from there I taught hundreds of people how to paint and uh, paint on silk and how to paint. And the instructions were very simple. They were like, do it. That's it. Here's the dice, here's the silk, have fun. And what I noticed was amazing. I noticed that most people either went too far and ruined their silk or they went not far enough. So what I knew in painting, which is the deliverable of the curriculum we offer, what I knew in painting was the sense of enough. I knew exactly when to stop. And I knew the piece was finished. There was no double guessing. Well, maybe if I added that, maybe if I painted that, maybe I shouldn't have done that. None of this was in my space. It was just a knowing deep embodied knowing in my guts that it was done. Mm. And I started feeling like, why is it that I don't know that with speaking, where I either underspeak or overspeak? Why is it that I don't know that in eating, where I either fast, or binge, why can't I know when enough is enough? Mm. And the answer was given to me by a prestigious gallery owner, and I was fortunate enough to attend his lecture. And he said a sentence I never forgot. He said, the mark of a true artist and of mastery is the ability to know when to stop. And when I heard that, it all congealed. And, and that insight, that potent insight, is how I dedicated my life to knowing that sense in everything I do not just in painting, but to have mastery in everything, which means to be a child at heart, up in heart, and yes, little e, H, little e, big R, T, because the H, E, the, the male principle, the part of me that wants to dominate and control and figure things out, and needs to know that part humbles itself, little h, little e, so that the art, which is cosmic, which is beyond the personal, could flourish. That's how I, one day, it was about five days, five years after I arrived in the States, it was following an extraordinary art show that happened in a gallery that was called Magical Garden. And it was the story through mythology of the garden. And it was water and it was scents that I had created and music and, and each piece reflected a side of the garden. And um, private, there was public collections that purchased some of my art. And the gallery director said to me, I never dreamt you would have that much talent. And I looked at her straight in the eyes and I said, never did I. And the day after the opening, it was on April, 14, 1985, 
I walked into a synagogue and I said to the rabbi, I'm an uncanny artist and I'm here to learn humility. And you know, I could see in his eyes that he thought I was a joke. I mean, first of all, I was dressed like a fashion model. My mother had, was into fashion and a designer had trained me. And so style was never something I missed. But this rabbi looked at me and wondered to ask you a question. Where did she, did she come from? Who's that? Three weeks later, when I offered a diptych on silk, eight foot square, to the sanctuary, painting 10 commandments in ways that were not imagined thus far. He saw that I was an uncanny artist and he offered me his help and the key to his library because then the desire to learn humility struck him as being truth to. And that's when I became commissioned to take the Hebrew language of the Bible and reveal in it a meta language by which I could heal my communication to myself. And that's what I wanted when I walked in the synagogue. I told God, you got me. I love that you made me a messenger. I love it. But if you want your message to go anywhere, you're going to have to heal my mind because I'm killing myself with food. Mm. I am crazy. So that's how that started. And when I'm speaking of the joy to finally publish something that makes sense, you can understand how many years it took to reveal a language in Hebrew that is just like music and mathematics. It belongs to life itself and no longer to a people. It is a language by which I can line up the part of me that knows what to do and the part of me that does not want to do it. Those two parts have a communication issue. So that's a little bit of the story. Oh, it's so wonderful. I, and I just, this, this last piece is so fantastic. Um, I mean, it's all fantastic. I, I just love though, that, that as you went into the synagogue, that became then your portal for truly yes. going into this deeper understanding of the Bible and the Hebrew language and really bringing those messages and those, you know, so much of it is in metaphor. And so it's understanding what it really is about in a totally different way where you can help share it with others. You said the magical word, you are so beautiful. And that's the whole point that Hebrew is the language of nature. It's not something you've learned, it's something you remember. And the word you said is metaphor. Now, that's a word that comes from the Greek, meta beyond for, to bring beyond, to bring someone beyond is what metaphor means in Greek. Now, take the word Ivrit, which in the Hebrew means Hebrew, just like English means English in English, or Francais means French in French. Ivrit is Hebrew in Hebrew. Now, before I tell you about Ivrit, I want to tell you that when I came to America, 
I didn't know English, I already said that. But I knew languages. I had studied Greek and Latin and Egyptian and Hebrew and ancient languages for like ever. And when I saw English, I started telling my friends in New York, this is a magical language. And they would look at me and smile. And I would say, but you don't get it. It is a symbolic language. So I'm going to take just a small example in English. The word scarcity, you know, which means lack. You can view it as scare city. Now, when I lose track of my nature, which is abundance, and I live and move into scarce city, the city of fear, I am terrified of money. I don't have it. I'm in lack. I only see that I am among the half nuts and not about the half. So that's an example in English. That example, take every letter of the Hebrew alphabet, every word of the Hebrew alphabet, and every letter is a word. And you have that depth of meaning because scarcity is really the city of fear. There's no question about it. Now back to Ivrit, the Hebrew word for Hebrew in Hebrew. Ivrit means metaphor. It means going to the other side. How? It also means the same word, just like you would do with scarcity, the E part is at I. And the Vrit part is covenant. The I of the covenant is how to go beyond. What does that mean? Decide, make a commitment, a covenant that your I, E, Y, E, and also the I, that you're going to ask yourself, who am I? Who is that I that sees lack? Until you can see that it is your nature to be abundant. So make a commitment to do shadow work. How? You have 22 Hebrew letters that have been painted as 22 tarot, about which Kalyan said, this is the initiatory journey of the hero. So you have a numerical alphabet, stages of evolution to keep you accountable to your word. And sure enough, one day you start telling the truth and you start being real and you're a child at heart. And it can be that simple. So Ivrit is the language of the metaphor. It is the language to go beyond the places where there's a misalignment in my communication. So that's, that's that simple. Well, and I want to talk with you more about this. I actually had a question for you that I'd already written down that has to do with this shadow work. Sure. And yes, because I think it's so interesting, you know, this thing of how do we explore our shadow and then stretch beyond the fear into the sacred. So we're going to continue this conversation and much more when we come back with Mahaleen Lewis right after this break. Welcome back to The Spark. I'm your host, Stephanie James. I just realized that I am pronouncing Maha's last name with the American way of doing it. Here we're speaking about language and Maha's last name is pronounced in the French way, Louis. Yes. So Mahaline Louis. So 
thank you so much for being here. We're, we're talking with her right now. We've been talking about her background. We're going to be moving into her book, The Code of Opposites. And what we left off with was talking a little bit about exploring the shadow. And because I know some of your book, I'm imagining talks a little bit about this and how we move from fear into the sacred. Yes. Ah, shadow, shadow work. That's the whole yin yang code of opposite. You know, the light versus the darkness, the male versus the female. And uh, the, the part that is so interesting is that we're speaking of currents, of flow, positive current, negative current. Okay. That's what moves the tree of our lives, whether in Hinduism or in Judaism. There's those male and female flow that twist around a central flow. What's fascinating is when I start calling negative evil. Mm. And now there's a recoiling effect. Now I start pushing against and resisting that which is the opposite force to light, to the positiveness. And I try really hard to be positive. Keyword, try. You know, it's Yoda who said, either do or don't, you can't try. You know, in, uh, in Star Wars. Yeah. Yoda, by the way, in Hebrew means, I know, the famous knowledge of good and evil. Now, this is what I mean by this language is everywhere. And certainly in movies that come from deep inspiration, such as Star Wars. Okay. But back to your question, I find it fascinating that um, the Bible would say that we're created in the image of God. The word image, it's salem, it's the root of it, it's sal, which is shadow. So we're created in the shadow of God. And to understand that, I need to go to Ecclesiastes 2.13. And I'm going to give you the traditional translation first. And then I'm going to give you the real translation, what the Hebrew says. Okay. So the, and you can check it out, the translation on the, in the Google it. The translation of Ecclesiastes 2.13 was, is and I saw that the light that wisdom is good and that the light is good. The real translation says, and I saw that the light, no, I didn't say it right. And I saw that the light is better than the darkness and that wisdom is better than folly. That's the traditional translation. And you read that and you're like, yeah, that makes sense, right? Yeah. Hebrew says, and I saw that the wisdom that comes out of folly is greater, just as greater is the light that comes out of darkness. A little bit different. Mm -hmm. okay. So I am created in the shadow of God. And for me to get to my light, I need to enter the shadow. There's no other way. Because greater is the light that comes from the darkness and greater the wisdom that comes from folly. So any 
addict, any alcoholic that has been graced, and it is a spiritual healing. There is no other healing but spiritual healing. Any alcoholic that has been graced knows that the curse of alcohol has become a tremendous blessing. Now, what does that person do? Possibly the 12 steps. Certainly the 12 steps are shadow work. Certainly. Mm -hmm. Make, take an inventory, make amend. There is no way out. The greater the folly, the greater the wisdom. So if it is your intent to benefit this planet, your voice and the quality of the gift you will bring is going to be proportional to the amount of madness you can transmute. That is how we are made in the image of God. That's very simple. Just takes a bit of courage and an enormous commitment. And I would also say that it takes a sacred witness because we're so good at lying. We're experts at lying. And to do, to complete, to come to the end of dissatisfaction. Because the Buddha was right. Life is dissatisfaction. The cause of dissatisfaction is the yearning. And there is an end to dissatisfaction. And for noble truth, there is a path to the end. So now the beautiful teaching of Buddhism are found their opposite in the beautiful teachings of the Bible revealed as a path to the end that has letters as signs on the path to bring you, me, anyone who sincerely desires it, that's all it takes, sincerity to the point of enough. That's satisfaction. That's the end of dissatisfaction. So now you can see how it all gets together. East, West, last light, darkness, Buddhism, Judaism, it's all one teaching. And the teaching is here for me to know that I am enough. I'm no longer flawed, damaged, good, and perfect. I am enough. I have enough. I do enough. Beautiful. Beautiful. And Maha, so in, in this book, The Code of Opposites, is that what you're bringing forth? Is it like, re is it a reinterpretation of the Hebrew, what those symbols mean in the Bible so that we can better understand? It's so many things, which is how it was so hard to introduce it, because it's such a big, I mean, we're talking of the three Abrahamic religions. This is not just your tiny text, you know. Mm -hmm. So there's several things. First of all, the Bible is the only book that has had that many commentaries. There is no book on earth that has had more influence. But what has been awaited was a novel interpretation that goes beyond superstition, that goes beyond dogma, and reaches into 
universalism, that no matter my age, my um, tradition, my upbringing, no matter who I am, it resonates with a level of common sense. That is what common sense means yeah. that resonates with me. So it's sort of like, you know, imagine during the war, there were codes. So you would have a message that would say, the, tul the tulips have not bloomed yet, but the roses have. And it looked like an inconspicuous message, you know. But to the decoders, they saw something completely different. So now you take the Bible and you have messages like, you should not be an homosexual, an homosexual. You should not cross dress. You should beat up the woman that committed adultery. And you're like, Get me out of that tradition. I'm much more like the Vedas or the common sense of the Buddhist scriptures. This is horrible. But when you see the code, you see something completely different. You know, so what the code of opposite touches you upon is for example, the Lord God, that which is translated as Lord, which is known mystically as a four-letter name. It's actually a verb, a process that has nothing to do with the dominance that the Lord God seemed to convey. So, there's different levels than one can read the Bible. One is what is known as the Prat. It's like, what does it say practically? Second is emotional. What's the wink? What's, what's, how do you, how are you touched by this passage? Because some passages are also beautiful, not all are violent and ridiculously chauvinistic and cruel. Yeah. Another level is mental. Uh, what sense, how are you going to interpret that? But the last level was the level that Jesus only taught to his disciples. Those were the codes. And uh, so when you see that in two letters, there's truth that are so profound that they would take an entire page to unfold. Then what happens is you start feeling awe, which of course is the sense of the sacred. So in between having something that is no longer violent, cruel, or stupid, and having something that has a sense of beauty and of the mystical that is profound and tying it to the nervous system by way of the tree of life, which is the true nervous system, and explaining cultural problems in such simple way, then the sense of awe gets repeated and repeated and repeated to a point to where that which I didn't have the courage to do, that which I knew to do, but did not want to do, I start no longer resisting it. Because we all have the answers. Shadow work is not about telling you what to do. It's about removing the blocks to your doing it. So, between a rigorous introspection and this uncanny and unbearable light and beauty that there is in this language, and having English to be able to feel it, I transform 
on my own. I start doing what I know to do. That's how it works. Simple. Just had to see it. You had to see it. So yeah. that's it. Wow. So, so incredible. So incredible. And I, it, it makes me wonder, when did you start this journey, Maha? How long have you been doing this? How long did it take to write this book? Okay. Um, at five years old, I was saying, one day I will write a book with Hebrew in it, and it will, it will create peace in the world. I was five. It took coming to America rebelling in the biggest way I knew, receiving this gift of art, having an eating disorder that would not quit to commit me to hearing my intuition telling me, just to reveal that Hebrew is a matter of language. This is the language that encrypted the DNA of chimpanzee and of human that the language by which the moon whispers to the ocean and the tree is born, that's nature's language. It will bring you to know that you are love. I started writing in 1985. Prior to that, there was five years of nonstop painting. So yes, I painted in the 10,000s of paintings, I wrote my heart testifies to it, about 300 books or more. I definitely stopped counting. But out of that, about 10% of it was real. And it was like, you know, when I left friends, I hated my family with passion. And I knew there was some, something sick about it. So each time that I came back to France each year, I would go back with the prayer to love my parents. And I felt miserably each time. There were fights and fights and more hatred. About five years ago, I went back to France and something must have changed because I started looking at France, seeing its beauty. That's why each time I was visiting, it was like in America, you know, and uh, I couldn't stand France. And now I was in Paris and I was just like, this is the most beautiful city in the world. This is where I was born. And I love the food and I love the streets and I love the people. And then I loved my parents. Mm. And whereas each time I went to France, it was with my computer and I was like closed up in my room, writing and painting. This time I didn't touch my computer. I just was with my parents, loving them, enjoying their presence, serving them, talking to them, discovering them. When I came back from that trip five years ago, my guidance told me, now you're ready to write. Now you're going to write Golden XPR. I didn't know what's called Golden XPR up to now. And so I wrote nonstop. And within a couple of years, 22 books were written that were the journey of the, the golden XPR, the path to the end. But I didn't have an introduction. I had just had those 22 books. Some of them were translated into French as an honoring of my family. But I didn't have an introduction. 
So I decided to write a book called Simplifying Consciousness. A year later, I realized that I was full of it. The book was full of it. Started back. It was about, at that point, it was about 13 years ago that I knew that what I was receiving was real, that I started coming up out of the doubt and thinking, now there's something real to this. This is when I met Michael Wolf, who was the co-founder of Empowering. You know. For 13 years, we fought because both of us had a big ego. It was about a year and a half ago that after the last violent fight, he finally got it. I heard you had to write the code of opposites. You're with a partner that is bringing the worst in you and the best in you. Leverage it, write the code of opposite. Moreover, take the word, the name of, Moe, of Moses in Hebrew, Moshe. If you flip it around, look at the opposite of it. You have Hashem, which is the name, the calling you're given. So Moses' calling was to turn within, go in the shadow, until he could bring the name, the divine name, the law to his people. That was his calling. Okay. So to know my purpose, the meaning of my name, Mahalin Lu ha ha ha, you know, big name big calling, to know the meaning of my name and to go beyond my name, to transcend even that identity. I must turn within. That is the basic of religion itself, the turn within. Now, I don't care whether you're a Muslim, or whether you're a Hindu, or whether you're a Christian, or whether you're an atheist or an agnostic, you're gonna have to turn within to know who you are. That, the language of Hebrew is the language of the turn within. Moshe, Hashem, that's Moses. It's, it's all, over Hebrew, you take two letters, you flip them around, and you get two opposites, a yin and a yang, a male, I mean, a female and a male, mm -hmm. a macha and a michael, that fight each other until they realize that opposite forces are complementary. They are meant to give rise to each other. So that's the subtitle of our book. It's no longer about being a top or a bottom. And yes, it's sexy, just like BDSM is. Yes, it's about switching roles, giving rise to each other. Male, female, I am both. I am created male and female in the image of God. We all are, there is no exception. So to be able to take that which we resist and leverage it so that the hatred turns into love, that's what Hebrew is all about. As a matter of fact, take the letters of hatred in Hebrew, and you have the reverse set, and you have the letters of love. It's magical. Well, Maha, this is all so amazing and, and so beautiful. And we're going to have to wrap this episode up. I could talk to you for hours. 
<laughs> and I just appreciate you bringing this beautiful book forward, The Code of Opposites. Where do people find it? Thank you. Just go to the code of opposites.com. If you scroll down, you're gonna see that there is an intro that is free. And then you're gonna see in 60 pages, I got it as small as 60 pages, all of what we discussed together. And of course, if you wish to support us, we have a copy, like a hard copy on sale at Amazon. You'll find all of that on the code of opposites.com. Beautiful. Maha, thank you so much for your time, for sharing just the beauty of your heart and this beautiful message coming through. Appreciate you so much. It's been a joy and a pleasure. Thank you for asking me, truly. I love you dearly. Oh, love you too. <laughs> thank you. Thanks for tuning in to The Spark with Stephanie James. Remember that you already have what you need to live a life that is fully lit and fully alive. You're already holding the flame. Now it's time to ignite your best life. Learn more at stephaniejames.world. That's stephaniejames.world. And tune in next week at 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern, only on TransformationTalkRadio.com. Shine on!